Welcome to Chai with Lakshmi Live, the first of its kind in what I hope will be a long series of amazing offline events where we bring together some of our amazing heroes, the people that we feature on this show, and our audiences, and let them interact. Here's an interaction that happened on the 15th of December in Bangalore. Which one of you would like to go first? No, it's, it's first your turn. I think, I think, I remember you were saying that you were super nervous, and I remember you saying that you had tons of questions to ask. To you. <laughs> okay, so go right ahead. I mean, she's been asking all of us questions, so I have questions to ask Lakshmi. So my question to Lakshmi is, what does Chai with Lakshmi mean to you and how did, what is your journey? We need to know that. <laughs> okay, it started as a blog. Um, it started as a way of me trying to discover what was right for me to do with my own career. And I guess at the age of 32, I finally discovered that something creative is what I was meant to do. Mm -hmm. And telling stories is what I love doing the most. And I, I think I've been absolutely blessed with a fantastic team that helps me tell these stories. What does it mean to me? I think I've always been associated with the developmental, development sector. And I've always been associated with, with uh, ideas that fix problems. I cannot look at a problem and not want to fix it. Or, you know, a bit like <laughs> you in that way. And therefore, to, to be able to interact with people like you who are doing amazing things and to relate and to be able to create a platform where, where I can share about your work so many more people can get to know and start focusing on solutions much more than on problems because if you look at what the majority of Indian media does, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to diss anybody here, but the majority of news out there, it's about what's going wrong. Yeah. And I think it's about time that media is about what's going right. Because unless we talk more and more about what's going right, we will not know about the kind of solutions that exist out there. We will not be able to relate to them, and we will not be inspired enough to come up with more solutions that work, and that can go beyond each of us. So this is, to me, um, a very constructive exercise, and I think media needs to be more constructive, and I believe in that, and therefore, you know, I, I do what I do, and I hope I can continue doing this for a long time. Thank you for giving us the platform. My pleasure. <laughs> pleasure. Hi, my name is Mohan. Um, congratulations to all three of you. I think you're all doing great work. Thank uh, you. My question is for Simu. Um, as part of your work, um, do you think at some point it is also important to educate boys? Do you think it is important at all? When we started talking to girls, in fact, uh, most recently I did a talk in a uh, government school near Electronic City, and talks on menstrual hygiene, help them open up and ask us any question. So the next thing that they ask when we, we open up the space and say ask questions, they talk about eat teasing, they talk about sexual abuse, they talk about rape. And where is eat teasing happening? Boys in the same class. And we can't keep closing our eyes to it. For the longest time, I did not find the right person, a male, who could talk to boys. Now, I can stand in front of girls and say, this is how I had my period. I can't say that in front of boys. I need to get them to relate to me, right? So that happened for me this year when Bhaskar came along. And uh, Bhaskar, I think you should. Yeah. Everybody needs to see you. <laughs> so the last talk that we did, the one which we had the video clips for Arti Gupi School. So while I was talking to the girls, I mean, poor boys, they, they're always so curious. Why do you send us away? What are you showing to the girls? We want to see something too. And that's when he said, OK, Bhaskar, please go and talk to the boys this time. And he went there and he spoke to the boys. These were high school boys, right? And uh, after the initial bit of warm up, he asked them, what questions do you have? You feel awkward, you can write it on a piece of paper and give. And they said, no, sir, we don't need to write it on a piece of paper. We'll just talk to you. Just come outside the class. Because there was a teacher there and they were a little wary of talking. And we go outside, basketball goes outside the class and all the boys surround him. And they very happily admit that, sir, we've all seen the picture. Mm -hmm. Phone, right? So there's a pen drive and it circulates and everybody's seen it. And uh, one boy very decently said, sir, I have not seen it. And all the others shot him down. I showed you the film, so please don't talk. <laughs> They've all seen it. And what they told him was, you've all seen it, sir, but we've not understood what sex is. Can you please show us the movie? And that, those boys thought that that's what I was showing the girls in the class, you know. <laughs> and so all the, when the girls, what the girls want to know, you know, the way things are, this, this is a very big eye-opener for me because girls are taught about sex in the, in the context of protecting and safeguarding themselves. They're told about rape, they're told about abuse. 
and boys are just curious to know what is sex? Why do girls keep refusing? I'm drawn to a girl, what should I do about it? So these are the questions that boys have. And we've just about started talking to boys about it. And you spoke about age group, right? What is a relevant age? I'm not quite sure of that yet, but I feel that we shouldn't draw lines based on age. When we go into any context, try and understand what level those kids are at. In some situations, the children in high school might know a lot more than children in colleges, in some situations. and some others, it might be different. So we don't go with a complete ready-made package that we deliver regardless of the age group. But it's always going in there and seeing what they want to know, whatever the age group is. For instance, for girls, if they're fifth standard girls, we don't tell them about sexual intercourse, right? So their question is that, uh, uh, when I fight with boys, why do they behave this way? And they're at that age where they really want to fight with boys. You talk to high school girls and their question is, if I touch a boy, will I get pregnant? And you talk to high school, I mean, college going girls, and they ask you, so if we have sex and use protection, is that fine? So it, is, it, it really varies based on the age group and the context and their living conditions. So we have to see that based on where we're going in. Did you ever have a chance to talk to the parents that you were speaking to? Comments? Yeah, I mean, in every session that we do before we go to the school, we request the school to please call the parents. We do this in every session, and no parent turns up. And we need to understand that these parents come from backgrounds where most of them are daily wage workers. If they miss one day of work, they don't get the wages for that day. And we, don't, we can't really go around incentivizing them or organizing for a lunch so that they come. But there have been inst uh, instances where we've gone to the community and talked to the mothers. But that has been very small in number. And I'm still not sure how do we get the parents to come so we can talk to them. If that can be figured out, there's much to be done. Uh, when we talk to the mothers, the conversation is mostly around, you know, a lot of women are held responsible in a bad way for having a girl child. And when I talk to women and tell them that it is not the chromosome from you, but from your husband that decides the sex of the child, they, their eyes just light up and they're like, all this harassment that my mother-in-law has, has put me through, I actually don't deserve it? And that's a big shock for them. So there's so much that we need to talk to the parents, but how do we get them together? And how many individual homes do we go to? I'm yet to crack that. If you have any ideas, it would really be welcome. I just want to say thank you because I think the work you guys are doing is incredibly important and vital uh, to the change that I think this country so richly needs and deserves. Um, so perhaps two questions, first of all. One that's gone probably to all, both of you, actually, all three of you. Uh, have you thought about kind of the next step of taking what has been successful now maybe into the political arena and having a larger effect? and the larger impact from kind of what you're doing today. And, and maybe share with you, uh, in terms of we normally kind of think of the decisions we make, these kinds of decisions that don't have such a huge economic value associated for an individual person, we tend to make some of these decisions based on uh, immediate needs or prioritization needs. So, in, in an area where water scarcity is going to become more and more important, how much more difficult do you think that trade-off is going to start becoming? So, uh Every tree holds 60,000 gallons of water. You know, it puts 60,000 gallons of uh, water per year into the water cycle. So that's the kind of groundwater uh, enhancement which happens with every single tree. And the kind of rates at which we plant, you know, the impact is 30 times more compared to a monoculture of plantation. So that's huge. But at the same time, uh, you once you have a kind of collaboration with different bodies, whether it is some uh, NGO which is working on, you know, uh, doing these studies of how by afforestation, how much you know water you have conserved, or by afforestation, what's the increase in biodiversity. These surveys we have tried to do, we have tried to do it ourselves, but we are not experts in that. So, again, you know, uh, there is a company in uh, Bombay. The CEO is uh, an Ashoka fellow. He is right now uh, working in giving us star rating systems to everything we do. So whether it is you know the light bulb which we are using or the kind of lawn which you are making or 
a, a tree which you are planting or a forest which you are making, everything will have a star rating and probably, uh, I, I'm quite sure that with the, the kind of work which we have uh, with us, we are going to get a very higher rating in you know, such ratings. So as and when these ratings keep coming in or a carbon credit system or such systems, you know, when they are introduced, if you have content, if the content is strong, which I'm sure that we have, uh, you are, you know, going to uh, go into the high value uh, sector of the industry. When we started, uh, we did absolutely, we never had an idea, you know, whom to go and approach because nobody in market is asking for afforestation to be done. Nobody knows. Uh, most, of the, most of us doesn't even know, you know, what afforestation is. First client we got was a furniture manufacturing company from Germany to become sustainable. You know, every uh, tree they consume, they plant in trees and issue a certificate to their customers. So such were the models which we had to develop to, you know, go ahead in market and do what we uh, always wanted to do, which is making forest. So the answer is, uh, of course, you know, we have to shake hands with the government, with bigger organizations, with the rating institutions. But it has to happen at a pace at which, you know, telecom industry uh, uh, has progressed or IT industry has progressed. So maybe we can, you know, have a, a wing like environmental enhancement industry or uh, this should be looked as a proper industry and not just something with, uh, which has anything to do with, you know, uh, social service or whoever makes forest is doing just because he has a good heart, not because he wants to do it professionally. He wants to make earn a livelihood out of planting trees. The moment, you know, we start looking at it as an industry, I think all the changes which you expect are going to happen. I think, I think I'd like to answer the question uh, on my own front um, very quickly. I see all three of us as ants, as little ants. We yes. see problems and we go out there and we want to do things and we are doers and it's hard for us sometimes to pull back, change our own mi mindsets and look at tackling issues um, at the level of politics, at the level of national leadership. I think there's a huge mind shift re re required and maybe over the next decade or so I will, you know, I will find the courage in me and the strength to make that shift. I don't know because I think running for government is a, is a very different deal to working at the grassroots and fixing things. And maybe also there's a, there's a, there's a lot of skepticism over going that route instead of being, uh, being the doers, being the ants. I think that very ordinary people like me can do extraordinary things if they're willing to take some responsibility for it. And you don't need a lot of money. You don't need a lot of influence. You need to be willing. With anything that I take up, I might we, I might start very small. There was one girl who came to me and I got to know that there was one girl dropping out. But my thinking has always been, what about the others? I can't put my arms around a bunch of children and say, these are mine and I will help them and I don't know about the others. And it's not just this country, it's humanity in general. And I have a natural tendency to think that way. So everything that I think, if you look at the way the Menstrual Hygiene Project has progressed from my own personal inhibitions, to that of an experience of one child, to that of 6,000 children, to the state and beyond. Definitely scale is on my mind, but it's not a maddening thing of scale for the heck of scale. It is about how do you reach out to everyone and not compromise on the quality of what you're doing. And be open. Let there not be any untouchability. I will not work with the political system, I will not work with the bureaucracy, I will not work with the civil society. Be open. And it's not about who they are, but who you are. If you are strong about your values, your principles, and where you will not compromise, everyone else will respect it. I have made presentations on the work I do to MLAs and corporators. And the response, you will not believe it, was they pretty much honestly said that we do a lot of work, but honestly we do it to get votes and to get popular. After listening to you, we would like to do something at least that is meaningful. Can you tell us how? So it's not so much who they are, who you are can influence everything else, all the other systems around you. And just keeping an open mind to work with everyone could greatly help. And definitely, we are thinking of impacting a larger audience, but not just to scale up.
Thank you. I think uh, we can take one last quick question. Have you ever gone back to see if the dropout rate has decreased? Uh, you know, the schools that you've already been Okay, thank you for that question. I'd like to narrate an incident to you along these lines. And uh, a lot of times, certain ideas are fed into our minds, right? Through media, through statistics. And my personal opinion is, please don't go by statistics alone. See what the reality is. There was a, a reporter who once wanted to cover the work I did this was last year. She was working for a German media house. She was freelancing, an Indian. So she said, I want to cover this issue. And I said, fine, come with me to a village, and we'll do the talks, we'll go to the community, we'll talk to them. So we went there, and we were speaking. And honestly, the, in Karnataka is what I can speak of, because I haven't seen the rest of India for this regard. The dropout rates, as such, aren't that high. But in fact, there are more girls joining schools than boys. Boys drop out, get into other activities, and stop coming to school. And these days, it's the girls who are being encouraged to study, and they actually complete. What actually happens is that they remain absent a few days from school during their period. And personally, I think this is fine. I don't think that's that big a deal, as we are making it out to be. If there isn't a proper toilet in the school. Now, we say that she has to change once in six hours. Most of them wear cloth. Can you expect them to go to a school toilet and wash the cloth there? The first time they get their period, they're experiencing intense cramps and pain. You expect them to come to school and sit there? I mean, the way we have created things, it is a man's world. All 30 days a month, we have to be there, present for work, and work come what may. And girls are supposed to be efficient. You're supposed to be equal to men. And women naturally have bodies which are in tune with nature. What is wrong in taking a break a few days in a month? Now, coming back to the issue of the reporter who came. So she wanted to have a really sensational uh, write-up about this, about how bad things are, and girls are dropping out of school. Oh, the issue is terrible, and oh, we are losing this, and women are not talking, and oh, women are. We, we've been hearing these stories of them using rags and straws, and I'm sorry, I haven't come across any of it. The worst was what I told you about the cloth, which hasn't been changed once in 10 years. The media, as she said, loves to project negativity because there's a lot of interest. Now, if I go and tell them, and you know, after every session of mine, though it's a heavy topic, the girls come out laughing and giggling and so happy. And she said, I can't shoot all this. They're all happy. I want sad faces. And you won't believe it. On Vajinti and I were, you know, we traveled to this village and we are back the village. And I asked her, so how did it go? And I was hoping that she would take home a very positive story of how things are changing in India, how girls are coming to school. And, children are not dropping out. She sat there and she started sobbing. <laughs> sobbing, literally sobbing. I was like, oh my god, what happened to you? She said, I'm going to be fired from my job if I don't give a bad story about India and its situation about women. Wow. I said, that is so ridiculous. People want to hear sad stories about India. They want to hear how the Indian woman is suffering, how the Indian girl is dropping out of school, and that is far from the reality right now. The thing is, when you go into any issue, can we go in with an open mind? Things have changed. You talk about, oh, this, everything is so backward. Gulbarga is like one of the most backward districts. I have lived and worked in Gulbarga. It is not as bad as we think. And the government, the NRHM, is doing a fantastic job. It is time we appreciate it. It is time you recognize it. And stop sitting here and just pointing fingers at the government and everything that's not happening. Things are changing. And before we make a statement about how bad it is, I would suggest please go and do a reality check. See it for yourself. From outside, and we thought something commercially more viable than something has been. Have you done any study in this Western class? Yeah, so I haven't done study, but uh, the common sense and the principle says uh, when you get a foreign species, either it will die or it will dominate. What is more dangerous is the domination. Whichever species is not allowing our native species to flourish is dangerous to the environment. For example, eucalyptus. Uh, there have been a huge number of studies, uh, certified studies and ordered by the court, Supreme Court, that we should not plant eucalyptus. This was one of the species which was 20 years ago being promoted by uh, you know, Forest Department. And, and where does it come from? Australia. I think uh, natural regeneration is the most cost-effective 
and the most environmental enhancing thing which can happen. Rather than having a lawn which takes so much water, so much chemical to simply get maintained, if you just leave it for one week, it will die naturally and again you have to replace the grass. If you have a natural forest, you don't even have to think about maintaining it. It will sustain on its own. By spending less, if we can get something which is 30, 40 times better than existing stuff, Rather than copying, we should go and teach, we should go and you know, give away these uh, new ideas, new methodologies to different places and do a business of the same thing. I mean, money, earning money is never difficult in, uh, if, if the stuff is good. One question for uh, What percentage of your time uh, are youngsters? Probably 40 or below. The reason is most of the young people don't own much of the land. Uh, any plantation we do, any afforestation project we do, on the day of plantation we just you know keep an open invite and call everyone, whoever can come, come with us, plant saplings. And that can be From a five year old to an yeah, eight year old. So the youngest is two and a half years old and the very next day a 92 year old person. So. People who are paying money, those customers may come from an age group of 45 plus. But the number of people we are working with uh, is always like 80% of people whom we are working with are, and our whole team is uh, below 30 including me. So most of the young people are ready to you know, get their hands dirty and uh, do something. Uh, but yes, because uh, you need land to make a forest, which belong always it belongs to you know somebody who has uh, earned enough money to you know buy land and uh, have a forest. And at the same time, if it is a corporate, the decision making is always done by uh, you know the top guys. But again, the teams with with whom we are directly working at corporate level, they are also 20 to 30 year old people. It, it has never happened that we uh, on a person-to-person -person scale uh, uh, work with a 50-year-old uh, person. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interaction with Sinu and Shubhendu, and I hope to see you at the next Chai with Lakshmi Live. Join our mailing list at chaiwithlakshmi.in forward slash subscribe and keep in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus and Pinterest.